Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Metrofit educational webinar series. Um, tonight, we are very lucky and very fortunate to have Dr. Tim Gabbett here as our, our resident expert for the evening, and the evening being GMT, of course. Good afternoon to all our colleagues in the U.S. and similar regions, and a very early good morning to all our colleagues in the, in the Southern Hemisphere, no doubt. But the theme of this evening's talk is training harder or smarter, should I say, and harder, with an emphasis on the and, as opposed to distinguishing between the two. And um, we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing from Tim himself and speaking with him. And um, of course, as with every webinar, there's a great opportunity for anyone listening in live to uh, send their questions in, and um, Tim will do his best to get to as many of them as possible. My own name is Keen O'Neill. I'm the Head of Department of Sport, Leisure and Childhood Studies here at Cork Institute of Technology in Ireland. Um, I'm delighted to be uh, sharing this webinar this evening. Very much looking forward to speaking with Tim and to hearing from him, but also just to look at the, uh, the myriad of questions that uh, we'd like to think are going to come our way. Um, of course, Tim can speak and speak and speak and provide us all with his, uh, his expertise and his experience and his research findings. but um, to really enhance the experience for everyone involved, a lot of the real quality will come from the questions yourselves out there. So um, be sure to send the questions in as uh, as soon as you can, and we'll do our very best to uh, to get those answers to you. As a practitioner myself, also involved in uh, in Gaelic football, which is one of the national games in Ireland, and uh, I'm particularly interested in this webinar itself. You know, and uh, it's something I've always had a passion for over the years, not just from my sports science background, but also from from being involved in, in sport itself from a playing and coaching perspective. So uh, it promises to be a fantastic uh, webinar for the next 60 minutes or so. So uh, we'll just introduce you now to, um, to our guest and our very special guest that is for this evening, Dr. Tim Gabbett. Uh, Tim, you're very welcome. Hi, Keen. How are you? And uh, thanks, thanks Metrofit, for, for um, inviting me in to, to have a chat today. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's great to have you, Tim. And just to let you know, speaking of Metrofit, um, CEO Peter Larkin and CTO Anne Brune are both listening in intently as well. So um, they're looking very forward to what you have to say. And um, there might be even some technical questions later on about a player monitoring or an athlete monitoring a platform such as Metrofit that, um, that maybe we can pass over to the guys. But um, that'll certainly come in at some stage when we're, we're talking about some of the key thematic areas. Um, particularly around training load, workload, the accrued product uh, workload ratio. Tim, do you want to give us a, a brief background about yourself? We can, we can see a little bit on the screen there, but just so, so everyone gets a, a feel for um, what you're looking forward to most about this evening. Oh, look, I think um, most, most people would be aware that um, I've worked in sport for, for 20 years and, and recently I've been been getting out and um, t talking to to different sporting teams, different sporting organisations. The the goal being to to help as many people as I can um, with the, the training load and workload monitoring area. Um, so probably the thing I'm looking forward to the most is is um, just people people uh, listening in to, to to how we've been going about workload monitoring and but also the, the questions that come in because obviously the the questions that come in um, is what brings this this research alive really um, it's it's no good just sitting in a on a piece of paper in a in a in a journal article um, it's it's the discussions and the debates that that come on the back of of that research that actually bring it alive so um, I'm really looking forward to to the questions and um, and on the back of this you know, we'll go out again and we'll do some more workshops where we can get face to face with people as well. So this is one way where we can we can talk to a, a pretty big audience and, and get the message out to a big audience. But then um, on the back of that, we'll go out and and uh, we'll do some more uh, face to face time as well and, and help people um, in their domain as well. Sure, and I mean that that makes a huge amount of sense, um, especially from someone like myself whose background is is education, third level education, and. Um, when we were fortunate enough to have you over um, some months back now in uh, Cork Institute of Technology, Tim, I think you'll agree, it really was the questions at the end of your, your presentation and your workshop that, um, 
that really involved and immersed people into, into the real applied area of sports science. And, and hopefully that's what we would get from tonight as well. But um, one thing that really impressed on me that night was, was just the title alone and your emphasis on the linking and the relationship between training smarter and that emphasis on the word and harder as opposed to training hard or training smart one or the other. Could you just uh, expand on that a small bit just to set the tone for where we're going this evening, Tim? Mm. Look, I, I think a lot of people have, um, as workload monitoring has come in, um, uh, a lot of people have gone, well, you know, we're not training harder, we're training smarter. So, so workload monitoring has is, is al almost been analogous with reducing workloads, reducing training loads. And um, it, it goes against a lot of the things that we know are beneficial about training. We, we know that if you can build high chronic workloads, it's actually beneficial. It, it not only prepares you for the demands of competition, but um, what we're starting to realise is that protects you from from injury, which is which is exactly the opposite to what we expect. We expect that high workloads cause injury. That's that's what we've been led to believe. Um, so so what we're starting to realise if we can build our, our workloads high, um, it protects us from injury. So so maybe training smarter is building workloads to a high level um, and, and is actually training harder. Training smarter is training harder. Um, and, and high workloads are important. It's just um, as as we go through this, and I'll emphasise it a bit. It, it's how you get to those high workloads that's that's really the really important part. Sure, sure, sure. And f from a perspective of training load and workload, do you see you know any difference between those terms? Are they just terms that people use interchangeably, or specifically, do you like to identify um, anything about those two that set them apart? Oh, look, I, I always used training load, um, but um, it, it can be a little bit misleading, I guess, if you because training load, um, if if you look at it, um, if you just look at it as it is, it is it is just training. So I, I think probably a better way to to encapsulate all of the work that that players, our athletes do, it's probably better to call it workload. Um, so workload monitoring it encapsulates both the training workload um, and the game workload. Uh, if you, if someone, if someone said to me, "Oh, look, I, I work in the training monitoring area, or, or I monitor training loads," I think, I think I would take the the logical jump and say, "So, you know, you also monitor game loads because because game loads are, are, are going to make up a um, a significant chunk." Of of your actual total workload or your total training load, so I sure. um, I think it could probably be used interchangeably. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I remember in the early days of this type of research coming out, you know, some people were unsure or unclear whether they they were to or should they be including their obviously their match load, which from a from a research perspective and even from their own perspective as a practitioner it was crucial to do so as opposed to you know just differentiating what is training on its own and forgetting about or you know omitting the workload associated with competition which is the reason we train in the first place yeah exactly um, and I uh, you know I, th I think this is probably where where a lot of people have been confused about their actual role with with training monitoring um, you know, I think I think a lot of people coming into this um, training monitoring area, the training and, and the sports science area, they see the sports scientist as being the person who pulls back on load. They're the one who who runs out on the field and tells the coach to stop training because they've done too much. But um, you know that that might be that might be part of of what you do. You you look at you look at the workloads to see who has done too much, but. That's only fifty percent of it. You know, fifty percent. The other fifty percent is: um, have we done enough? H have have we trained hard enough? Have we trained long enough? Is the intensity of our sessions um, great enough to actually prepare us for battle? And and that's that's the real trick is um, because what either way you you can under train or you can over train, and either way it's it's it could result in some 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 consequences that you don't like. Um, but what I what I have seen is it tends to get pretty ugly if you under train. 
Um, if you're if you're away a long way away from where you need to be um, in terms of physical preparation, then you you really have no control. You have a, a lot less control over over the results. You have a lot less control over what happens in competition. Um, and 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 as I said, you know, like um, the trick is is trying to build those chronic loads to protect you from injury, but just just to get there in a safe way. Um, and that's that's the real trick with with workload monitoring. Um, it's it's not that high high absolute workloads are a problem. Um, changes in workload can be an issue from week to week. Changes in workload from week to week, or or rapid spikes in workload can be an issue as well. Absolutely, and that that'll bring us on very nicely to um, to another thematic area that we'll talk about very shortly: the actually acute chronic workload ratio. But just before that, there's a, there's a term that you coined very effectively and appropriately when you were speaking in Ireland some, uh, some months ago, and that was the whole issue of resilience. I mean, it's, it's a word that you use repeatedly, and I think if you look at the key core characteristics of successful teams or even individual athletes, you know, independent of sport, you know, no matter what it is, resilience will always be up there at the top. And, and, and that's a phrase that you coined when talking about um, building up resistance to injury as well in terms of prescribing load, isn't it, Tim? Yeah, look, it's, um, there's, there's a few things that we can, we can look at from a load monitoring point of view. We, we can look at it to identify um, the, the players who are potentially at risk of injury. And, and there's, a few, there's a few people out there that um, that would say, um, you know, that we can predict injuries before they happen. Um, and for me, it's it's a it's a pretty tough thing to be able to predict injuries. Um, it's it's sort of like predicting the weather. There's so many factors that can that can impact potentially impact on injury, um, and it's a it's a multifactorial relationship. And it's it's going to be changing all the time. It's going to change from from season to season, and also change within phases of the season. So the the way that you can you can turn it around is is and make it a little bit easier to um, for for the majority of people to to get their head around is um, if it's so hard to predict injuries, maybe what what we're better able better able or, or uh, Maybe what we're better at, uh, better off putting our time into, is actually looking at the factors that create um, robust and resilient players. And we know that there's there's certain physical qualities that, and and certain um, um, characteristics of athletes that actually protect them against injury that throw a lot of load at certain athletes, and they're very robust. They're, they're very resilient. They just never seem to break, um, whereas where the others break all the time. So, what we're starting to, um, to spend a bit more time on is if, if it's so hard to predict injury, maybe we're better off trying to identify the factors that create robustness, because sure. they're things that we can we can have a lot more control over. Um, and and one of the big ones is um, well developed physical qualities. So when you're strong, when you're aerobically fit, you you tend to be you tend to be more robust. You tend to be more resilient. More resilient. So, so how do you get those physical qualities? You actually have to train, and and you have to train pretty hard. So it it still comes back to um, a physically hard and appropriate training, and 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 that's a big way to to develop the robustness that you need to protect your players against injury. Sure, and I, I guess that leads us nicely into the second thematic area that we were hoping to discuss tonight, which is the whole area of the acute chronic, uh, acute chronic workload ratio, something that, um, that you spend a lot of time of your profession and obviously personal life into this and all the research uh, surrounding this area. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Tim, if you could just give all our listeners just a, a brief surmise, a brief synopsis of, um, of basically how you arrived at at this notion of the AC workload ratio, and um, and we can talk a little bit more about it with specific examples thereafter, if that's okay. Yeah, look, uh, the um, the acute chronic ratio. My, my first exposure to it was was through um, Andy Coggan, who'd done a lot of work in cycling with this ratio, and um, you know, so 
you know, I think I think it's important to acknowledge that the the great work that that he'd done really early on, but but this this concept um, goes back a long way, right back to some of the early workload monitoring studies. Um, one of the things that we noticed with with our players when when they were breaking down was it it wasn't that they weren't that they were breaking down at high loads. We'd, we'd look at their loads, and, and you wouldn't look at it and go, "Geez, those loads are excessive." But then, when we looked at it in terms of what they'd done over, you know, the preceding four weeks, um, it, quite commonly it was a massive spike in load. Um, so this is this is where we started to realise that it's that it's not not load that's the problem. It's it's the load that you're prepared for. Sure. Um, so I think I think most people can see that the that slide that says acute acute load. Um, each one of those bars represents a, an acute load. So acute load can be as short as as one session. Typically we use week to week in Australia, but um, it'll vary from sport to sport. Um, some of our congested schedules, like basketball and uh, in the NBA and um, in the Premier League in England, we will use different acute loading periods, but um, and and we use different chronic loading periods as well, and I'll talk about that in a second. But but each one of these acute acute load bars, all you can see there is the numbers uh, are not that important, but you can see that acute load is building. Mm -hmm. And then and then what we do is we just calculate a chronic load. Now the chronic load um, is just the load that you've done over a longer period of time. Um, we would use um, a four week window, but um, we use that as an example of you know it takes a longer time for chronic load to build. Um, it could be as long as six weeks, or it could be seven. It could be could be eight or twelve weeks, um, or it could be as short as three weeks, depending on your sport. Um, but the idea here is that acute load is is analogous to fatigue. Chronic load is analogous to fitness. So at any given time, you're not just looking at workload. You're looking at um, the positive and the negative effects that come with training. So you're, you're looking at the fitness effect that comes with training, and you're also looking at the, the fatigue effect. Now the last the last thing you do then is is you just you look at the ratio of those two variables. So you look at the the acute to chronic um, ratio. So you, you take your acute load, you take it and you put that over your chronic load, and that gives you a ratio. So We've got a couple of just um, examples there, and they're, these are just they're just random numbers. It, is, it could be the the distance that you that you run um, a thousand. It could be the, the number of jumps that you do in a in a session or in a week, sorry, versus you know what you do over a longer period of time. It could be the the amount of times you throw a javelin. It it really or, or a baseball. It, it depends on on the metric that you're using to measure load. But what you can see here is that when the acute load is low and the chronic load is high, it gives us a ratio, in this case, of 0.25. And what that tells us is, is what we've done over um, the last week is one quarter of the work that we've done over a longer period of time. But if we, if we flip those numbers around and, and this time we say, well, you've done 4,000 throws of a baseball in this week, and you, over a longer period of time, you've only done a thousand. That gives you a ratio of four, and and what that essentially tells you is uh, that the work that you've done in this week is four times greater than what you've been prepared for. So in essence, um, you should go into a game and and you'll be feeling sore, you'll be feeling fatigued, and probably at risk of injury. Yeah, I mean it, it. It makes it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You know. It's hard to believe it hasn't been around as a concept, you know, many, many years and decades ago, but it's brilliantly put together there. And I guess from a coaching perspective, you know, two phases of a season spring to my mind straight away, Tim. The first one being preseason, and the second one, particularly in amateur sport, um, which Gaelic Games are in Ireland, which I'm heavily involved in, is, is when we get an opportunity with amateur athletes to go on a training camp. And you literally have, you know, these guys together for five, six, seven days, and um, because ordinarily they work and they come to training just at night time, it, it's almost, it's almost dreamt up and planned that you would fit as much work into this training camp period or indeed preseason 
and very often that's what can lead to a significant breakdown, you know, in terms of athletes with predisposition to injury. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, that, that's, that's the, the common challenge that, that every, every sport I work with has. Um, at some point in time, there's the black hole. Um, and the, and the black, I call it the black hole because um, there's a period where our, our athletes either go away for, for off-season, so we, we lose contact with them, or uh, we might send them away to international duties, or there's a, there's a break, a bye period or, or a couple of week break in the middle of the season where, where we lose control over what they're doing. Now, it's, it'd be really easy to just throw our hands up in, in the air and say, um, well, the, the ratio is not important or it's, it's too hard, um, but essentially it's not the ratio that's the problem. It's, it's that you know, we're, we're, losing, we're losing control of the thing that, that allows us to calculate the ratio, and that's load. So we could throw our hands up in the air and say, well, it's, it's just too hard, it's not worth the effort or um, we could try and find a solution to it. And, and wherever there's a problem, there's a solution to it. It's just um, you know, how, how creatively and um, how hard you're prepared to work to find it. Um, so there, there'll be, um, but that, that is a big challenge, whether it be the NFL, whether it be, um, whether it be the NBA, or whether it be any of the sports that I work with, um, with, with Premier League or, or even over in Australia, any of the sports over here, whenever we have a break, or, or whenever, whenever we have a buy period, we've got to try and find ways that um, when we bring our athletes back um, from that break that we, we don't spike their loads because we know that one of the biggest risk factors for injury um, is spikes in workload. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, I can, see, I can see how that could be done relatively easy and very much structured in pro sport, in a pro sport setting, Tim. Um, in an amateur sports setting where a lot of our listeners might be coming from, what would your recommendation there be when you have relatively limited access to your players um, as opposed to a professional model where you have them full time pretty much 24-7 if need be? Um, do you have any recommendations there just to make sure that you get that balance in your, uh, in your chronic preloading, if you like, before this period, if that is what you're recommending? Mm. Yeah, look, I, I wonder, look, some of the, the really early projects that we did in this area were, were done in um, you know, amateur and semi-professional athletes, you know, where we had limited access to them. Um, so I, I still think, and I still think if you're, if you're motivated enough to, to do a good job, um, you can get the information you need and you can, and you can progress your athletes in a, in a safe way. Um, and, I, and I fully understand in, in those amateur sports, you tend to, you, it's not only the fact that you, you're working full time and then going to coach on the side. Um, when you go to coach on the side, you end, up, you end up not only being the coach, you end up being the, the strapper. You, you end up being um, the person who fills up water bottles, you, you end up being a skills coach, and then you end up being the psychologist. You end up being a, a lot of different roles, um, playing a lot of different roles. So that's probably the biggest challenge that you've got in the amateur level is just having to fill all those different roles. But the, the concept will be the same. Um, um, you, you'd like to know what what work your athletes have done in their off-season break, and, and you could, if you if you don't have sophisticated technology, if you don't have GPS, it doesn't really matter that much because you can um, you can still take a training history. You can you can ask your players, and that's that's going to be a, a step in the right direction. It's going to help you a little bit um, to find out what they've done, um, you know, in that off-season break. So when we do our our pre-season screening, where we we check for um, where the physios might do some some musculoskeletal screening, we set up another station which is a, a training history and we just okay. we, we talk through with our athletes, um, you know, what have you actually done over the last week and what have you done over a longer period of time and, and, and what you'll find is some will say, well look I knew I was coming back for pre-season um, and I didn't want to break down on the first night so the day before I went for a road run just to pre prepare myself. 
Um, and then you go, and then then you start to realise, well, he's done nothing over a over a long period of time, and all he's done is spiked his workloads and put himself at risk. Sure. Um, and then others others will tell you different information. They'll say, look, um, I, I trained every second day. Um, they were short sessions, but they were intense sessions. I did this much. I, est I, I would estimate I did this much high speed running. I did um, this this many throws of the ball, or I did. Um, this many weight sessions, resistance training sessions. So uh, you can start to build a, a model for, for your different players. Yeah, no, that's great. Interesting, we just got a comment from uh, one of our listeners, Andrew Wiseman, just uh, endorsing exactly what you're saying there uh, in terms of the, the definite challenge trying to get figures from players who are away for off season. Their training history station sounds like a great idea. So, uh, so Andrew is definitely on the, on the same page there. As you, but um, we have Bob Malkman in Canada. Bob is just wondering, Tim. You talk a lot about acute load. Can you identify or discuss what impact intensity of work plays into determining acute load and chronic? So the intensity, as opposed to strictly the volume. Yeah. Well, when when we, it's a good question, Bob. But when we when we talk about load, we we talk about. Um, Load is essentially a product of of volume and intensity, and if and if we're um, if if we're, we're we're being strictly accurate, it probably is a is a product of frequency as well, training frequency. Um, we we can we can look. I think I think one of the things that most people or that some people I come across when we talk about training harder, the mistake they make is that training harder equals training longer. So they're not actually, they might be training harder, but, but, but what they're actually doing is increasing their load just through, through longer sessions. They just get longer and longer and longer. And there's going to there's gonna be a balance, I, I think. I think you can, you can train tr too long. I think a, a, a lot of the overuse injuries that we get are not necessarily intensity related. They're, they're actually volume related. So we just we end up doing long, slow sessions, which which in the end probably doesn't prepare us too much for anything. Um, it doesn't prepare us for the high intensity demands of competition, and and what it actually does is is probably um, contributes to to some of our our overuse related injuries. Um, there's always going to be a balance, though. Um, if you do if you do too much high volume sessions, then then that's going to be a problem. If you do too many high intensity sessions and you over you overemphasize intensity, high intensity at the expense of of lower intensity recovery sessions, that's going to be a problem as well. So you know what we recommend is is um, is making sure you you cycle appropriate recovery in between your 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 either high load or high intensity sessions, so that you if you do a high intensity session on Monday, um, depending on on the intensity of that session, you might need two two days, possibly three days, to recover from that before you can go back and do that again. Sure. Um, so um, it'll always there'll always be a balance there between um, intensity and volume and and frequency, and and those three things are going to that are going to contribute to load. Um, in, in different ways. If I had a if I had a choice of going, um, and of course we would never just do just do one or the other. But if I had a choice, I would I would lean towards um, intensity in sessions rather than than a whole heap of volume. Um, I, I just I just find um, one of the the hardest things that we that the hardest things to to be able to do in training is to to reach those really high intensity repeated effort. Um, you know the, the worst case scenarios that that players are required to do in competition. Um, so I, I would be aiming towards getting getting at the intensity components rather than building load through heaps and heaps of volume. Sure. No, no I, I think you've addressed that very well. And Bob, hopefully now you're you're satisfied with that answer. And uh, I think anyone who coaches will will be able to associate a lot with what you're saying in terms of intensity within sessions as opposed to just strictly volume. Um, interestingly, the slide that's presented now in front of everybody um, ties in with uh, a question that's just coming in from Derek Malone, Tim. And Derek uh, asks, in your experience, are the acute chronic workload ratios the same for youth and developing athletes 
as more mature athletes. I'm particularly thinking about the so-called sweet spot ratio from 0 0.8 to 1.3. Great, great question, Derek, and uh, th thanks for coming on. Wayne. I, um, I've seen, I've seen the name, so it's, um, uh, and, I, and I do, I do follow you um, uh, on Twitter as well. So thanks for, thanks for taking the time out of your day to come on. Um, so I think there's a couple of a couple of things to, to keep in mind with, and most people would be familiar with this um, this figure. Um, the, the the sweet spot, and you know the theoretical sweet spot of being between 0.8 and 1.3. Um, we we can see that when you're in that that zone where acute loads and chronic loads are roughly equal, then your your risk of injury or your likelihood of injury is pretty low, um, and and roughly at a ratio of 1.5, we, we see that the, the likelihood of injury starts to increase. Um, now, it's important to keep in mind, um, and, and this is a really, really important point, is that that I think a, a few a few people have sort of latched onto 1.5 and said, well, you know, we can't go over 1.5 because um, as soon as we go over 1.5, that's we, we end up with problems. 1.5 is not the magic number. It's really important to keep that in mind. And then it's important to keep in mind that different people are going to respond differently to the same load. So on, on that particular graph, you can see that there's some, some players who um, will be well over a ratio of 1.5, but their likelihood of injury is close to 1 or 2%. Sure. Um, and, then, and then there's others who are theoretically in the sweet spot, but their likelihood of injury is up around 10%. So, um, it, different people are going to respond differently, and the, and and the ratio that that's protective for some will actually be predictive for others, and and a ratio of one point five and above might might not be predictive at all for other people. That they might be your robust athletes. Now, to answer your question, um, it, does it differ for for younger and older athletes? Um, one of the things we have we have seen, and this is, this comes from. Um, Shane Malone's work, who, who's done some some terrific work over in GAA in Ireland. Um, you know, if you haven't if you haven't read his work, in, you need to read his work because he's uh, he's very motivated and he's doing some really really cool work in um, workload monitoring and looking at the factors that protect against injury. What, one of the things um, we know physical qualities are important, but one of the things that that are also important in terms of being able to tolerate different spikes in load um, is is just age so when when you're young and when you're really old you tend to um, tolerate spikes in load differently you, you you don't tend to tolerate them as well um, what I think is happening and, and part of the issue is we, we just don't have large enough data sets to know for sure but what I think is happening is your younger your un, younger athletes when you spike their workloads, they're probably more likely to suffer um, bone stress-related injuries. So uh, age up to about 23, 24, you're at greater risk of bone stress injuries. Mm -hmm. And then at the other end of the spectrum, when you're older, um, you don't tolerate spikes in load as well either, um, but it tends to be more muscular injuries that you get um, at, the, at the older end. And then somewhere in the middle where you where you hit that 27-year-old spot, that's that's sort of where you're flying, and and you have the lowest risk of injury. So you, you you're over the you're over that um, risky area when it comes to bone stress injuries, um, and you you're not yet old enough to to have that that high risk of muscular injuries. So yeah, I I think age age is definitely an issue. Um, we just don't have enough data at the moment, Derek, to 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 say for sure, you know what those ratios will be, but it'll differ for different sports um, and um, and and different variables as well. So it'll probably be different for for baseball than it is for something like um, soccer or or something that involves a lot more high speed running. It's interesting um, that you bring up that point there. Because for me, what was going through my head, Tim, as you were saying, that was the importance of communication in an interdisciplinary um, backroom or support team for our athletes, insofar as that the, the principle of individual difference, 
of course, that, that applies to all our athletes, particularly in team sports. But then the knowledge and the experience of your strength conditioning team, of your medical team, your physios, your doctors, you have your coach and your manager who want these guys on the pitch all the time. So it really does reinforce, doesn't it, the communication and, and you know, the level of, of mutual understanding between all these, these experts to make sure that the right guys may be able to push back that, um, you know, push past 1.5 in certain cases. But some guys may be less resilient than some girls. And then um, you just got to be careful that you're not pushing to them to that point at all. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give you my experiences with it, and then I'll probably throw it back to you too, Keen, because um, from from a coaching perspective, because you've got to try and pull those the, all of those groups together and get them working together. Now, you know, I'd be interested to hear, you know, from a from a head coach point of view, how you how you manage those relationships. But um, you know, for for me. Uh, we're, we're all looking for the same thing. Um, if you're if you're an athlete, you want to train consistently. You, you want to be, you, or you want to be able to string string consistent sessions together or string consistent games together. If you if you're a coach, um, that's what you want as well. You want to you want consistent time with your athletes so that you can you can build a team. Um, if you're if you're a conditioning coach, you want consistent sessions. Um, and and from a, a physio point of view, you would prefer to have them out training than treating them because when you're treating them, you're working too hard. Um, so so everyone's looking for the same thing. Um, it's just that the, the way we go about it sometimes is different, and that's where I think the, the head butting the head butting comes into play. That um, we have our different beliefs on on what's an, an important way to develop resilient athletes. Sometimes, sometimes we have to push. Um, sometimes we have to pull back, and it's it's understanding when we need to push a little harder and when we need to pull back. That's that's the real the real art of of coaching. And and to to be fair, I think that's probably where the workload monitoring um, information can come in handy. Um, the, the workload monitoring can actually provide a, a, um, some numbers to support that gut feel that, that we all have and that we've all developed over a long period of time. Um, and, and, and probably that's where um, monitoring programs like Metrofit come in handy because you've, you, can, you can store those numbers and you can access them in a usable way, in a user-friendly way. Um, where you can you can look at a player, you can you can trust your gut feel, but you can also have those numbers in the background to go. Well, um, this is what this is what I feel is happening, and then this is what the numbers are telling me as well. So you don't actually have to rely on on just gut, and you don't have to rely um, just on the numbers. You, you've got both of those things to support your decisions. But what Absolutely. what about you, Ken? Like from a from a coaching point of view, you would have you would have had. Um, Different, different situations where at times you've had to, you know, the team's flying and you feel you can push them a little bit harder, um, but then other times you might have had injuries where um, where you felt you had to pull back a little bit. And um, how how does that go with the strength and conditioning and the medical staff and managing that relationship? Yeah, it certainly is one of the biggest challenges I find. You know, especially being in a manager, a stroke head coach role now. Um, the early stages of my career, I would have come up to the strength and conditioning ranks, so I would have seen things from that perspective. Um, and then evolving into more of a coaching, technical, tactical role um, to where I am now. So I've, I've almost been very fortunate in many ways to, you know, to have dipped into different aspects of sports performance from uh, player support and from a coaching and management perspective. But um, I think a lot of it has to come down to a, the trust that you have between your, your colleagues in the, in the backroom team, but also B, for me, one of the most important things is actually how well do you know your athletes. Sometimes I find that a 30-second to one-minute conversation with a player before training you know, can elicit more information than any numbers that could be put in front of me there. Just because when you know your players, you get to know what makes them tick. Um, you get to know what's going on in their lives in amateur sport. A lot of, a lot of players these days are students, um, and that's where I find uh, Metrofit is a platform we use from a, an athlete monitoring perspective. You're looking at stress levels. You're looking at mood states. You know, apart from the obvious muscle readiness, muscle soreness, sleep duration, sleep quality, 
apart from all of those things, it's actually the almost a humanistic um, variables that give me the best information about where a player is head at. And very often, where his head at will directly inform where his body is at, you know. But um, I've been very fortunate to work with a really, really good crew in terms of the medical team, sports science support team. And, and you know, sometimes we get it wrong. You know, we had a really big challenge with a particular athlete last year um, in terms of return to play protocol because he was quite unique. Um, phenomenal speed, phenomenal power, phenomenal athleticism, um, but broke down repeatedly even when we were quite modest with our return to play protocols and quite conservative, you know, and that was a challenge and that was a learning experience for us all and it certainly informed our protocol this year with him. But we would have adopted a very different protocol with seven or eight other uh, other athletes on the squad as well. And that's where I think knowing your athletes and that principle of individual difference and the uniqueness of individuals becomes uh, becomes very, very important. Um, in professional sport, you know, if you have a management team that changes, if you have a backroom team that changes repeatedly, it's very hard to get that history of rich personal knowledge. In amateur sport, it's impossible because you know um, team management teams and backroom teams tend to tend to change by their very nature you know every few years um, to a lesser extent in pro sport but um, I think that rich vein of knowledge about, about players player history player background you know it, it's hugely important yeah I, I agree with you hundred percent there it's um you know if you, if you were trying to make uh, and quite often quite often I get I get questions where someone might send some data and there'll be a, a ratio of 1.5, and that's that's the only data that I'm given, um, and they'll they'll ask me to interpret the the, the, the organisation will ask me to interpret that data, and and quite often my first question is, um, give me some more information, <laughs> because um, on its own it's it's very hard to, to interpret that, and in in reality. You, in sport, you never just make a decision on the numbers. You, you're always having discussions of, okay, well, this is what what the numbers might say, but then this is as a group. This is what we've seen. This is what we're you know you're having these discussions all the time, and all of those discussions they they don't go into a database, but but they go into the decision making process. And it's important to to keep those. That's important contextual information that you need to, to keep in mind when you make those those decisions. Um, so a, a number of 1.5, a, a ratio of 1.5, you and me can mean completely different things um, based on our training history, based on our injury history, based on our age, based on our physical capacity, based on where we are in the season. Um, so that there's that there's always important contextual information to keep in mind when you're when you're interpreting that data and and, and prescribing on the back of those of those numbers. Absolutely, and just keeping on the the sub theme there of backroom teams. Before we get back to, we have a lot of questions on the, on workload workload calculation, acute chronic. Um, Tracy Blake's just come in there. Hi Tim, have you found that your work has changed the relationship between coaches and sport medicine staff? namely coaches as stakeholders in injury prevention? That's a very interesting question. Oh, oh Tracy, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I, I think I would like to, I would like to say yes, um, but um, I still think there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, a lot of room for, a lot of scope for, for improving this in this area. Um, we we still have the the vast majority of people who who come along to our workshops are, are medical and strength and conditioning staff, and and we're we're definitely we're definitely helping those people. But um, what I what I also find too is that those those people those professionals are you know I feel like I'm I'm sort of preaching to the choir a little bit. You know the concepts there are. Uh, 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 concepts that they that they understand that yes we, we get it it's it's improving our understanding but it's it's not as though I'm starting from from you know ground zero either um, I'd, I'd really like to see some more coaches come along to it um, but you know part of that is is going to be the way that we present this information as well um, you know we've we've got to um, got to um, appreciate the fact that. Um, coaches have a have a different way of 
um, taking in this information. They have a different way of um, of, of learning than than the way that that we've we've um, developed our learning skills. We we have a, a certain type of fitness where we can sit we can sit in lectures or we can sit in um, conferences for a long period of time, and we've got the fitness for that. Whereas co coaches. Um, you know they learn in a different way. They don't. The majority of coaches don't want to be sitting sitting down um, in a conference all day. That you know they just it's that a lot of them would prefer to to talk over it, uh, over a cup of coffee. And and quite often that's the way I get out to coaches. Now it's it's just hard to to get to a large number of coaches, the same number of coaches that we can get to say the medical staff over a cup of coffee. Um, but um, when we have conversations like that, it's um, they they can appreciate it. They understand their role in it. It's going to take a long time, though. It's um, because historically, load or load monitoring has always fallen to the medical and the the strength and conditioning guys. It's it's never actually been seen as a coaching issue. Um, you know, coaches coaches have sort of gone, well, oh yeah, load, yeah, our medical guys take care of that, or our or our strength and conditioning guys take care of that. We we, you know, we're the skill, skill coaches. We teach skill. Um, um, what we're trying to 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 get across to to coaches and medical and strength and conditioning and the athlete themselves is that everyone plays a role in keeping that athlete injury free. Um, right from the the time that the the player is in off season through the worst case scenario, everyone in that training process has has some ownership over um, injury reduction in trying to keep that that player injury free um, yeah. so it's it'll take some it'll take some time to 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 get coaches fully engaged in that and and maybe it won't happen in my lifetime maybe someone will pick up the baton and, and they'll they'll run with it but you know it's you know I'm not throwing my hands up in the air and saying it's too hard either I'll keep working away at it and um, keep chipping away at it and, and the more people um, in the medical and, and strength and conditioning community who understand um, workload monitoring and understand this concept of of making sure athletes are prepared for what we're about to ask them to do, um, the more likely that, that information is going to filter back to coaches um, in, in a wide range of sports. So we'll just we'll just keep pushing the message out there and um, and hopefully coaches will, will get caught up in the groundswell as well. Absolutely, communication and education, really, Tim, isn't it? Communication and education. Yeah, I think so. And but also understand that we, you know, we've got a team that we've got to build, and and coaches need to get through their work as well. So there's got to be a little bit of give and take from both sides, I think. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. We've uh, a couple of quite prescribed questions. Um, getting back into the area of acute uh, chronic workload and the ratio associated there. We'll move on to them. So a couple of people have been queuing up. Fergal, Fergal O'Connor has asked um, about acute chronic load. Um, is it a workload versus fitness using GPS? Can one calculate um, the ratio by distance covered one night versus what is planned for a period or a training block? Well, wow. okay. Can you can you repeat that one? I, I, there's a few, yeah, few things. I was wondering, um, using GPS, as his method yeah. of external load, obviously. Um, yes. Can one calculate acute chronic ratio by distance covered on one night versus what is planned for a period or a training block? You would always recommend this looked at over a week as opposed to over just one session, like a session. Uh, oh, okay. So, so it's more about um, using the acute, the acute load um, in, in a much shorter window. So rather than a week, using it over a night or a, yeah. a training session. Oh, look, this um, it depends on how how sensitive you'd like to get with with your acute load. Um, you know, the the concept of a of a week is not is not um, it's not locked in. It's not just um, uh, set in stone. We we can actually. Um, we use a week because in in Australia we tend to play from week to week. We play one game a week, and our micro cycles we, we tend to work from Monday to Sunday. We tend to work in weekly micro cycles. But um, there's nothing stopping you from from doing a daily load or or a session load if you wanted to be that sensitive with with your acute load. 
Um, I, th I think the important thing to keep in mind is um, if if you um, there is some smoothing that occurs with with a week worth of training. So there's the the, the week's load will smooth out. Um, the highs and the lows that come within the week, the high and the low sessions. And, and when you use um, a much shorter window, you, you lose that smoothing. So there's, there's peaks and troughs, um, much bigger peaks, much bigger troughs, and, and the ratio, the acute chronic ratio will reflect that. So um, you, you'll just have to make sure that you don't jump at shadows when, when, you, when you look at the ratio as well. So it'll, it'll go from, from uh, 0.8 up to 1.8, down to 0.7, up to 2.7, and it'll be, it'll be going up and down, up and down. So you just have to make sure that you don't go, oh, no, we're, we're high, oh, we're low, we're high, we're low. Um, just, just keep in mind that um, it'll reflect the, the polarised training, the, the highs and the lows, the, um, the high intensity and the recovery sessions that come on a, on a daily basis. But there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing a, a much shorter acute window. Absolutely. And of course, the, the nature of the session as well, relative to the content and what the goal or the objectives of the session will have an impact there too. So yeah, I agree with that. Mary Glynn has just come in here with another quite specific question. How do I decide the chronic period for my particular sport, Tim? What are the general guidelines? Well, I, I, I guess it'll depend on the sport. If, if what I, what I would generally suggest is if if you if you have a sport that um, is very very physio physiology based, um, where your athletes uh, are working close to their to their limit of physical capacity, and in a sport where it takes a long time to to develop those physical capacities to actually compete at a high level, then you might you might use a longer chronic loading period. And I'm talking about sports like triathlon or, or ultra endurance events or, or endurance sports, I would suggest a longer chronic loading period. So maybe three or four weeks isn't enough when you're, when you're really fit to, to actually bring about changes in, in fitness. For a, for a congested sport, if you're, if you're working in a sport where you're playing multiple games in a week, um, then I would probably suggest a, a shorter acute window. Um, maybe maybe um, one week is too long, and maybe something like the NBA or in um, Premier League Premier League football, you might you might take a three or four day acute window. Um, and again, it, it'll I, I can't tell you the exact the exact window you should use. We've used one week and four week because it fits fits well within our our microcycle and our mesocycles, um, and and it just so happens that it, that it also is a very good model for being associated with injury. Um, that that model has um, consistently been shown in a number of different sports to relate to injury, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one week and four weeks is going to be the ideal model for for your particular sport. And it, it might be that there's a, a little bit of trial and error, a little bit of suck and see, and um, and just to work out what is the best model, um, and I'm happy to, you know, if you need to contact me after this to with some with some more specific information on the actual sport to, um, you know, to to talk through some of some of the ways that I might work that out for you. Very right, good. We'll, we'll just take one or two more questions on this thematic area, just so we can get to um, maybe a little bit of athlete well-being, um, Tim. Mike, uh, in the States, has a question. When measuring workload during matches using the RPE method, do you assign the load or do the players? I would think players would tend to overestimate RPE for matches because a lower number would mean they were not playing hard. Thanks. So um, this is something that often comes up in, in subjective measurements as a question. What's your own thoughts on that, Tim? Look, su subjective monitoring, it, it is what it is. Um, and I've said this a few times. I'm I'm not emotionally attached to to the session RPE. I know that there's some limitations with it, and um, you know I think I think most of us are aware that that uh, some players overrate, some players underrate, um, some players um, we won't say they lie. They stretch the truth um, when it comes to to you know how hard they've actually worked. Um, 
you know, it is what it is. Um, but but there is also some pretty good evidence to show that it's a it's probably one of the best methods that we have for capturing a whole heap of different different workload um, ver uh, metrics, a different a different training session. So whether it be field sessions, skill sessions, gym sessions, game loads, recovery loads, we can we can capture a whole heap with RPE. Um, so I think I think when interpreting the data, you, you probably need to need to appreciate where the athlete has come from in in terms of what is their training history. Do they actually know what a hard training session is? Because a, um, a, a lot of a lot of our our young athletes that we see see now, they just they a lot of them haven't trained hard, so and they haven't learned how to win a session. And um, so so part of Part of the process is, is not necessarily, um, it, it, it could be education around RPE, but it could be just education around training and, and learning what it takes to train hard, learning um, what a hard training session feels like and, and learning what it takes to, to actually win a session where you, where, you've, where you can go one of two ways and you have to actually push a little harder and then they realise, oh actually I probably wasn't training as hard as what I thought I was previously. Um, I actually can push myself a little harder, and that's what a hard session feels like. Um, and that that doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen with one session either. It happens over a period of time where um, you, know, you know we're constantly trying to to help our athletes, you know, learn how to win those sessions. It, it takes time to get to that point. Um, real, realistically, though, if 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 you're talking about um, you know, a group of a group of te uh, of athletes. If you've got a team that, um, you know, the, the coach or someone is saying, "Look, those RPEs are rubbish. Our our athletes are lying. You know, they're not telling us the truth." If it, with you know the RPE is the problem, the RPE is not the problem in that case. You've got a bigger problem than the RPE if your athletes are lying about those sort of things. Yeah, you got um, a coaching issue going on there. Uh, there's. There's, there's going like if they're lying about RPE, then chances are they're they're not being honest in a whole heap of other areas of their preparation as well. And RPE is probably the the last the last um, thing that I'd point the finger at. It's it's probably a, a you know an overall a cultural thing that you probably need to look at. Sure, sure. We'll finish, uh, Tim. Just Shane has come in here. Shane Maloney just has a question. We'll finish on this theme because we've got uh, very little time left. Um, he says, Tim, have you seen any variation in training and match play outputs? With minus one Z scores for wellness um, or well-being. Yeah, look, there is there is some work out there, Shane, um, that that has shown that uh, well-being can impact on um, on your your f uh, physical outputs, um, and and. You know, if if you have poor well-being earlier in the week, then it can impact on on what you do later in the week, what you do physically later in the week. Um, and then if you look around the AFL literature, you'll you'll be able to find some stuff there. And that's that's probably um, probably the closest the, the closest sport that you'd um, you'd get to 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 your um, Gaelic football as well. So it's probably pretty relevant to to football over in Ireland, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. Um, there's a couple of questions, guys. We're not going to have enough time to get to them all, but we will we will revert. We'll get back to you um, uh, via email um, going forward in the next couple of days. I just wanted to finish up with the whole area, the whole notion of athlete well-being, player athlete monitoring. Tim, uh, from my own perspective, working in Gaelic games here in Ireland, obviously being an amateur sport, but played at an elite level, and and players training very close to professional standards in many ways. It's, it's something that for me has been one of the, the major developments in amateur sport um, having online platforms such as Metrofit which I would use every day and so far as getting reports every day by 10, 11 o'clock you know from our sports science support informing me about where athletes are in terms of you know simple uh, psychometric markers such as sleep quality, sleep duration as I said, fatigue, health, muscle readiness from an amateur perspective that's crucial I know from a professional perspective you have more time and you have more control over athletes 
How do you think this whole notion of player and athlete monitoring ties into the research that you are doing and conducting in training load and workload? Well, well I, I think it's, um, I don't see a, a, a distinction at all, Keen. It's, um, the, the research for me is just, um, I've, it's essentially I'm doing everything that uh, all the listeners are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's how I work. I, I work with sports, just like you would work with um, with your athletes on a day-to-day -day basis. I do the exact same thing, but um, the way I talk about it is I've sort of kept a diary along the way and just um, written written it up um, so that people people can benefit from it. Um, now they can they can choose what they do with it. They can look at it and they can say, look, this is absolute rubbish. Um, this is this is not what I believe in. Or they can they can look at it and um, and they can say oh look it, this is a different sport but I can see how it relates I can see how the concepts relate and it's it's really up to, to people what, what to decide what they do with it after it's out there um, uh, you know I just I just felt the information that we we're collecting um, it's for me it, it it goes across it transcends a lot of different sports the concepts go across a lot of different sports and it made sense to me to to just to, to go that extra step and try and try and put it into a paper, write about it and, and share it, and then people can decide um, how they're going to use that that information. Some will apply really well to their sports, others others not so well. But either way, they can they can make their own mind up over over what they want to use and what they don't want to use. Sure, sure, sure. Anthony O'Regan has just come in on the same topic there. How early should we be trying to collect data with the likes of Metrofit and how long do you need to be collecting it before you get the maximum value from the data, Tim? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of, of how, how long is a, a piece of string, but um, it, it'll depend a little bit on your, on your question. Um, so um, I, I think um, data like the, the the data that you collect with Metrofit, your, your well-being, your your load information. Um, once the the real benefits are, you've got you've got a pretty um, pretty stable platform there where you can you can um, it's it's data based well, and you can you can bring that information up all the time. I, I would say as soon as you've got four weeks worth of data, you've got one training cycle, then it becomes pretty important information, but. But in reality, it's probably even sooner than that, depending on your question. So if you want to know um, how hard were our athletes training today, um, you, you've got as, as soon as you have your first night's worth of data, you've got you've got information you can use. It, that's that's answering a question for you. How hard were we training? Were we training hard enough? Were we not training hard enough? So the first time you collect that data, it becomes useful. Um, and then and then the more complex your question. Um, you might need a longer period of time if it's if it's something where you where you want to look at the relationship between load and injury. Then you might need a longer period of time there. Um, but but theoretically, I would say um, as as soon as you start collecting information, if you if you've got a question in mind, um, that information starts to become pretty useful. If if you're just collecting numbers looking for a question, then it might take you a little bit longer. But if you have a question in mind to start with, um, then then you're on your way. You, you can start answering questions pretty much straight away. Absolutely, and for for me, one of the key things, and I, as a coach, I always come back to the whole the whole principle of education and developing that culture of wanting to be a thinking athlete, an educated athlete. The key thing is that the players, and this also ties back to the question about uh, the honesty with uh, with RPE. But if the players really grasp the fact and understand that this is actually all about me developing and progressing to be the best athlete I can be, you know, to optimize my potential, it should automatically become, you know, natural and innate to them because athletes, as we all know, are inherently selfish individuals. Um, hmm. in, a, in the sporting context, of course, you know, um, and you know, if they realize how this can inform their practice, their coaching practice. Um, their coaches practice, should I say, their backroom practice, they'll buy into it a lot quicker and adherence will be, you know, will be informed to a much higher level and, you know, they need to understand that. And I think that's the first port of call when you use any platform um, like Metrofit, but also Session RPE when you're applying it to, um, to workload. If they really have a grasp of why you're doing this 
and where the benefit lies uh, for you, for your team, whatever the case may be. I think that's always a good starting point. And it can help to develop every other aspect of culture as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you 100% there, Keen. And, um, you know, it's, 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 not about, it's not about us and them. Um, you know, we're, we're all on the same team and we're all, we're all looking for the same thing um, from, a, from a, whether you're on the coaching or medical or performance staff, we're, we're all driving towards getting the best for that athlete and, and helping them achieve their goals, helping them um, become winners in, or you know, or and that and winning can be uh, mean a lot of different things. It could be just achieving something more than than they previously thought they were capable of doing. Um, but you know, we we want the best for them, and um, and a big part of that is educating them around, um, you, you know, what actually works, um, what what's what's the evidence around training. You know, there is individual responses, but. Um, you know, we get, we aren't training hard just to punish you. We're training hard to actually prepare you for battle, to prepare you for what you need to do to keep you safe, to keep you to try and keep you injury free. And then when you have to make those big plays in a game, that you're actually physically and mentally prepared to do it. Um, and that's uh, being able to to engage with your athletes and and get them on board with that is a, is a massive part of the the training process. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, Tim, we'll, we'll bring it to a close on that note. Sorry, folks, to those who we didn't get to your questions. I think um, Bob and Shane, we got to one of yours. We didn't manage to get back to them, but we'll do our very best to get to those very soon. Um, Tim, on behalf of myself and everyone at Metrofit, but more importantly, um, the huge amount of following that has been tuned in here tonight and those who will tune in retrospectively, we'd just like to say a huge thank you for imparting your, your knowledge, your expertise, um, all that you've gained and earned over the last number of years. And um, we'd hopefully like to get you back on again and maybe we can extend this conversation further and delve into, uh, into a few similar issues, uh, you know, to a greater degree. But thanks very much from, uh, from me here in Ireland and uh, from everyone else all around the world who's listening in, Tim. Oh, look, I, I really appreciate... Um I really appreciate talking to, to coaches, Keen. So any time you you want to um, have a chat about coaching, just <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to happy to come on again. It's um, I really appreciate the opportunity, and and thanks everyone for um, for taking time out of your day. Um, you know I appreciate the support that you've put behind um, this concept. You know, and, and we're actually uh, with your help, we're getting a lot of discussions around load. We're putting it back on the agenda as being a, a really important. A really important area of sport where we we um, we're actually preparing our athletes as as well as possible. So I appreciate um, everyone's support and, and you taking the time out of your day as well. Super, Tim, you're a gentleman, and um, Tim, you can probably get back to bed now. It's what is it, six a.m., seven a.m. Uh, Brisbane time? <laughs> uh, I'm up now. I may as well stay up. I might go do a session myself. Good man, good man. Just make sure there's no spike in that uh, training workload. Do you hear me? <laughs> Thanks for the thanks for the tip, Kane. Okay, guys. Good night. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are around the world, and tune in to any future webinars we have with uh, Metrofit. Take care.